Welcome to Nailing It Down, a product of Varmblog. And I'm going to talk more about Vilifredo Pareto. I mentioned in my overview on Pareto that he had a theory of elites, basically the lions and the foxes. But his theory of elites is a sociology of personality more than it is a sociology writ proper. For a man so associated with engineering and math, his understanding of elite competition is based off the idea that the 80-20 rule consists of the 20% being of two basic types, the strong and the cunning. And in 2017, like many things being rediscovered from the beginning of the 20th century, as Donald Trump came on the stage, as Americans are narcissistic and haven't noticed that the tendency for strongman or cadillo politics have been emerging all over the world, and that even relatively stable oligarchical states like um, China had been developing or returning to more central figures of authority. We, we should ask ourselves, what is the meaning of this competition between the foxes and the lions? And then why most people assume in sociology that the 80% is inert. Because this is something that comes up in other thinkers who are influenced by Pareto, but who are not Paradians, I, I guess is what we might say. Michael Lynn, for example, talks about interleague competition. He gets linked into PMC theories, but he's actually not a PMC theorist. He believes right now that there is an overclass of which the bourgeoisie is a part. And there are two ruling classes that are diametrically opposed to each other. A petite bourgeoisie linked with the politically conservatives and a mass of professionals linked with liberalism as two different and opposed classes with different interests in capital. The petite bourgeoisie favoring strong nation states, strong national policies, but low taxes. And the professionals needing a high tax base, although they're also willing to pay a high tax base because they assume they'll have high incomes, but large government investiture and high levels of carteling. So specialization being rewarded, the quote, meritocracy. Now, Lind is not explicitly, as far as I know, pulling from Pareto, but his two classes that he sees as the battling of the elites, the elite professionals versus the elite petite bourgeoisie, roughly align in values to the lions and the foxes. The lions prefer traditional religion, strong nation state, investment in land and military. They are traditionally a more conservative but less mercantile faction. And the foxes, being cunning, are more manipulative, social, willing to use skills capture and other means to get an advantage, favoring trade and international order and cosmopolitanism when it suits them, but are always looking out for the lions who can overpower them with their focus on military might. Now, interesting, in contemporary society, it may actually strike us as strange that the military itself is actually somewhat leery of lion characters. The reasons for that should be obvious, though. The military's largesse is tolerated by all factions of American politics and most of the world, even when they're complaining about anti-imperialism legitimately, because it is a U.S. military that allows international trade. And as that is changing very quickly, even within the U.S. itself, this is the rational core of Peter Zion, we can see that we are in a time 
of differing politics amongst elites. Now, what is interesting, and Lind, Lind doesn't clearly model to the lions and the foxes because Lind also has an overclass that prefers the rule in secret. The people you can't see and definitely aren't who anyone calls the PMC. They're the established families. They're the established leaders of the military. They are the deep state or what we might call the established members of the administrative apparatus of the state. They are the people who will never show up on the Forest 500 because that's for nouveau riche fools to not have to have their money so obviously accumulated in one person instead of in large family holdings that go under the radar. Pareto, whether we like him or not, and there's reasons to, to not like his politics, however, thinks that this battle is the battle of the 20%. That maybe the top, the, the, the high achievers of the 80% may also be caught up in this battle, and that is the realm of politics. And I hate to tell you, but that is a fairly accurate description of the way politics works in highly oligarchical orders. And most democracies have a tendency noted all the way back to Plato towards oligarchy, one that modern historians often deny because it's ugly. And yet that is where the what if America is the new Rome? Or what if France is the new Rome? Or what is fill in the blank of Republican polity here is the new Rome comes from the realization that without systems in place to mitigate against it, and these systems are not automatic. They have to be set up, made material, I build infrastructure for, etc. And then maintained with guiding principles which generate ideologies which generate political programs and planks. And we can talk about this in terms of economics even if you think the economic base is a more important base. Because while the basic structure of capitalism is worldwide, how capitalism is managed does change dramatically from country to country, and even culture to culture within the country. Just watch how businesses are run in the South versus how they are run in the North. Vestigial parts of other societies, of prior societies, may hold on in different ways. The Marxist does well to actually think about this, to learn what this foxes and lion things is about. Because while the Marxist understanding of class may predict the basis for Sir's characters, the petite bourgeois being Bonapartist and the Bonapartist character being the lion and the professionals and the financial and academic elites being highly into liquidity, internationalism, trade because it enables them to increase holdings and or knowledge in real and substantive senses, i.e. foxes. But the working class, however you define it, is not in that picture. Hell, even most of the, quote, PMC, if you believe in that category, is not in that picture. Because by elites, we mean elites, not just holders of agrees or people who could possibly be in a cartel profession, who still draw a wage. No, we mean the decision makers, the actual managers, the people in government, the people who have effect. You're not just talking about the people with access to decent jobs, but the people who actually hold them.
understanding this is important because it's why solidarity is so hard to build. Someone asked me why today we are more atomized and there's low social trust and solidarity seems to be so easily disrupted just by invoking race, gender, or whatever. And I always say, one, there are real slights there that have to be addressed, the quote, triple oppression, if you want to go there. But two, and more importantly, that each of our stages has developed to the point where there are oligarchies within them. And that many of these oligarchies now function with attention of needing a mass base as things become harder and harder to manage because they are too complex. While not wanting to deal with a mass base because it is hard to control with no central figures holding it together. See, the lions and foxes fight amongst themselves. But society accumulates beyond that, something that Pareto actually was aware of, but later thinkers such as Joseph Tainer actually spell out. Now, you may be noticing that I'm now more commentating on the meaning of Pareto or Microland or whoever. If we want to talk about the substance of class, we have to admit that there are professionals amongst us who wield a lot of power, particularly in academia, that those professionals increasingly come from a closed class loop because you have to have the leisure time to access the things you need to build a CV and to do things like unpaid internships. That even things like journalism, which used to be an unskilled job, by the fa by that I mean you just needed a high school education and you pick up the skills on the trade, maybe you go to community college and you can make a decent living in the media doing local papers, has been undone by both technology, but also the technology eroding any sense of local community, which is why no one knows what's going on when things actually matter at the political level. This is mostly leveraged, weirdly, by conservatives who understand how to operate at that level through church networks. But even those networks are getting harder and harder to utilize. And in a very real sense, it increasingly looks like what I said. The lions, the suburban petite bourgeois and professional who works in businesses who, who are very low profit rates and very affected by tax rates versus the rentiers, the foxes, who are urban professionals who are being currently disciplined right now by interest rates, but who largely have dominated the economy for the past 30 years. Neither, however, really has any incentive to fix industry, to reinvest in infrastructure, etc. At least, even though all may know they need it, no one wants to do it at the expense of another class and competition. It becomes one of those free rider problems. Doesn't have to be that way, as I talked about in the video on Eleanor Ostrom, but it is. Now, the question for those of us who want a more emancipatory top politics is why is that the case? Why is it the case that the 80% is uninvested? I've been pointing out for years that the majority of the working class are the majority of non-voters. I've also been pointing out that even in places that have mandatory voting that are slightly more progressive, such as Australia, and I have mean ever so slightly, um, that it really doesn't look that much different than the United States. So the idea that that's the only problem is just not true. In areas like Australia, the battles pretty much look the same as here. Just more people are involved and you have thus more local interest kind of 
to deal with. But I would bet that we would see a similar trajectory and focus on national politics. We have definitely seen that in the Americas and in Britain and in a lot of Europe. We talk about the Americanization of European politics, even though none of the constitutions are really anything like the U.S.'s. But the old civic associations that held those things together and kept the party strong have largely fallen apart. So we apply Pareto's lions and foxes, even though it's a loose archetype. And one that really should be tightened up, Lynn's innovation on basic structure actually is explanatory. Peter Turchin talks about this in generational cycles, but also when competitions between different sectors of the elites like Lynn. See, elite competition and the problems of different sectors of elite capture is something sociologists know a lot about, but I don't see leftists and Marxists talking about that much, even though it is directly relevant to our job. And when we do talk about it, we try to force it into a framework of talking about the bourgeoisie or pretending someone is, quote, petite bourgeois when objectively they're not and don't act like it either. It's just that the categories we are stuck with are of the five or six categories that Marx uses in his polemical writings are in capital. Marx is really only concerned with the base contradiction between two. The worker who is increasingly socialized by capital and the bourgeois who often has to regress to prior political forms to maintain power. But these other intermediary forms have turned out to really matter. This is something that we should learn from dealing with the likes of Pareto. Our response should be, what makes the 80% care? Because sometimes they do. The most militant working base is often in places like China, where it has no formal representation. And I mean that because the All Chinese Workers Union doesn't strike. So the strikes are all wildcats, and concessions are often given even if leaders are punished. So there is an informal recognition and folding in of worker militancy outside of legal constraints. This is not me being praising or criticizing the Chinese. We see this in a lot of countries. Whereas unions from the Nordic world to the Americas often are organized quite differently. In Europe, they are often arms of the states and they don't do the formal organization that the U.S. movements do. They're just assumed de facto, you know, like a fourth part of, of the government, like the fourth estate, but for labor instead of just knowledge or the general public good. Pareto gives us something to think about, about the, the way capitalists fight each other and the way our society's politics are actually managed and what is going on. But we should be very clear that neither side has the interest of what socialists should be concerned about. Maybe socialists are wrong and we have to deal with that. But then we have to ask ourselves why neither the lions or the foxes in the United States seem even basic level competent outside of the military. And the military is where this breaks down because military leadership is very cosmopolitan. While there are very conservative elements in the military, even unto the intermediary leadership, the generalship is generally highly educated, pretty cosmopolitan, and fairly apolitically centrist. 
with some exceptions. Now that the neoconservative tie to the military has been ended as a result of 2008 and military popularity has declined, however, it is still the highest uh, trusted organ of U.S. life by the general population. We have to ask ourselves, what are we not seeing in Pareto's lions and foxes with the military? when it seems like they are something like a fox lion or maybe a tiger. That's when these archetypes and metaphors break down. Sorry, Jordan Peterson. The tradition has limits. I hope you find this helpful. I've decided to go back and revisit some of the thinkers I've covered so far to further explain why they're relevant even to our political thinking in a way that's a little bit smoother. I reference two articles indirectly. I will include them in the show notes and some other stats. Um, as a side note, I'd like to thank my patrons for supporting me. And for those who are wondering why I cover my hair so much, um, I'm recording this after... Uh, sitting Shiva for my father um, and my office is often cold but right now I am not shaving my face or cutting my hair um, as as a sign of mourning so I'm going to talk about it so if you're wondering why I'm wearing a hat all the time it's because I just don't want to deal with my hair um, thank you for your support. It means a lot for uh, to me. I hope you share these videos. Um, I think that they are worth sharing. Have a good day. We fear this. We fear that they have something out that the majority of the people don't know about. They will learn some how to learn, how to learn, how to learn. Now I'll show you how to learn. Now I'll show you how to learn. Pent up feelings that, that may result from decades of repression and people who've had members of their family killed by that regime. A lot of killers. Get a lot of killers. Why do you think our country's so innocent? But I won't attack it because someone fixed me up. I don't let anybody use me to fight their battles.